Well, let's talk a little bit about fluoroscopy. So, um, and you guys know this, you know, there are a lot of different fluoro systems, whether you're in the IR room or you've got the GI fluoro unit or you've just simply got a C-arm unit. Um, you know, the point is they've got a receptor and they've got a, an X-ray tube that kind of move in concert with each other. Um, this is in regard to a GI fluoro unit, and I'm actually going to show you one of those and talk about it in specific at the end to just remind you how some of the things that we talked about in these first two talks apply to our X-ray imaging. And I really want to use GI fluoro because that's one of the times when you're in the room co controlling the parameters that we talked about necessary to make the image. <clears throat> so components of the fluoro system. That image intensifier or that flat panel detector. So I'm going to ask the same question I asked yesterday. How many people still utilize some fluoro systems with an image intensifier instead of a flat panel detector? So, th those, so there's a couple people. There are, they are still out there. A few years from now, I think, for me to talk about image intensifiers isn't going to make a whole lot of uh, sense because they're being replaced fairly quickly. So. <clears throat> With flat panel detectors, right, we don't need a lens or an aperture or a camera system to take a picture of the image being developed on the, you know, the II is like an old cathode ray tube TV kind of thing, and we've got something taking a picture of that. Um, II systems do have that. They have a lens to focus light on the output phosphor of a TV camera. They have an aperture that you can open up to increase some of the light that's let through in that TV camera. I'm really not going to talk about those uh, things. But I do want to talk a little bit about the II because it's something that kind of always confuses folks a little bit. On our old fluoro systems you know, with II, you know, we had this automatic brightness control. So if you had a bigger patient, less x-rays made it through them and so you got less light output on the II and so the brightness control would increase the tube current so that the number of x-rays made it through the patient were increased and the brightness of the image would stay about the same. In other words, it increased the dose to the patient. The automatic dose control unit is somewhat of a similar thing in the digital systems um, where it's going to kind of adjust the dose to make sure that that stays fairly constant. Just notice these parameters relative to, to radiography um, here. Uh, you know, notice that for KV or in a similar range, but our MA values are lower uh, for fluoro versus radiography, and I'll let you guys look at those. So those old image intensifiers, we really, when we did fluoro, we basically worked with a large lower dose. And so we really needed to intensify the brightness of the image so we could see that nicely. And so an II consisted of an input phosphor that converted those X-rays coming in to light, a photocathode that converted those lights to electrons. And the nice thing about electrons, we could accelerate them because they have charge, right? We could use... Um, uh, positively charged plates to accelerate them and therefore have them strike another part of the II with much greater energy than they initially started with, giving us a, a brighter image. Those focusing lenses and accelerating an anodes basically amplified the signal and those uh, electrons then hit that output phosphor and converted those flow of electrons back into a visible image, back into electromagnetic radiation. You know, here's the picture, right? X-rays came in, the material here was responsible for converting X-rays to light, then this some system here took that visible light of lower energy and converted that to electrons. We then sped those electrons up and they struck this output phosphor where basically that process was reversed and we had a camera system that was taking a picture of what was going on there and displaying it to us. Those image intensifiers, by the way, were made with this cesium iodide once again for some of the reasons that we talked about. When you took a big area on the II and you brought it down to a smaller area on the output of that II, you got some increased brightness solely due to the minification gain, right? If the number of photons hitting this large area is the same as the number of photons hitting this small area, the small area is going to appear brighter. But in addition, we got gain because of that electronic amplification by accelerating those electrons. So you could really end up with a system that amplified that input image brightness, you know, 
50 times, um, which was very, very helpful. Unfortunately, those old IIs had a number of artifacts. They have, um, even our current ones, suffer from lag, right? They're not as quick as kind of movie cameras, so as things move, we see a little bit of persistence and the motion lags behind a little bit. They have something called a va veiling glare. And if you'll notice that ideally when something struck the input phosphor, if it should look like this, by the time it hit the output phosphor, there was a little bit reduction in that contrast because some of those electrons may have strayed off of path and reduced the, the difference there. We'd get these pin cushion artifacts, you know, because that II was really a glass tube like an old CRT, and so the f surface of it had a little bit of curvature to it, so something which was a, you know, parallel grid of holes would look like they had a slight curve to them, especially at the periphery. With the flat panel detectors, we don't have that issue, right? With these uh, amorphous selenium digital detectors, we don't have those issues. They can get read out very quickly. We don't have the, the pin cushioning, the veiling glare. We still have some, some lag issues. Bad pixels is the problem now where, you know, you get a dark spot or a bright spot because one of the pixels on the array has gone bad. So let's, in the last few minutes here, finish up talking over one of our uh, GI fluoro systems. So let's, GI fluoro unit, right? You just step on the pedal and you start snapping fluoro spots. And hopefully what we got from these first couple talks as you put them in practice, I want you to think a little bit more about that, right? I, I want to emphasize, especially in terms of any, you know, uh, examination you might take, right? The first thing you should think about is, verifying that you've got the correct patient, right, the correct body part, the correct procedure and everything. And then we'll get started with, with doing um, the procedure. And we've got to decide what type of fluoro we need to be using for this procedure, and we certainly want to know if we're using contrast, what type of contrast. But um, let's talk about what all these buttons, by the way, we have a Siemens fluoro unit, so that's why this is a, I've got a picture of the control panel on that. I'm not trying to, to sell any Siemens equipment or anything, it's just what I've got. You can see me in the background taking the picture here. So here I've got circled the KV and the MA controls, right? So remember that increasing MA increases the number of photons in the X-ray beam. It's going to increase the quantity of the X-ray beam. It's going to result in increased dose to the patient and it's going to result in decreased noise in the image. So if our image is too noisy, one of the first things we do is bump up our MAS. It has no change in the percentage of Compton scatter uh, to photoelectric uh, effect. And so then therefore it has no change in the image contrast, just decreases the image noise. And there's no change in spatial resolution. When we increase KV, that increases the average X-ray beam energy. It increases the quality of the X-ray beam. Unfortunately, it also increases the quality of the, the, the quantity of the X-ray beam. And we talked about how going to higher KV gives more efficient production of x-rays. So not only do you get a higher average energy of x-ray, you get greater number of x-rays when you do that. The resultant increase in Compton scatter decreases our image contrast, so we typically do this secondary to changing the MA. We prefer to first change the MA to get appropriate image uh, quality if we can, and not change the KV unless absolutely necessary. It doesn't change our special resolution. And then I put this because it's very important. If you don't have automatic exposure control on and you increase KV, you increase dose to the patient for the reason I just talked about. You not only increase the quality of the beam, you increase the quantity of the beam. But if automatic exposure control is turned on, which it typically is when we use fluoro, then the dose to the patient actually goes down because it says that it, the image is adequately exposed with less MA or MAS than it was before you increased the KV, okay? And the change more than compensates in terms of dose. So always keep that in mind. Sometimes people are confused a little bit about why there's a difference there. Why is it that sometimes people say to me, increasing KV increases dose to the patient? And I read somewhere else, increasing KV re results in decreased dose to the patient. And the key to that answer is whether there's automatic exposure control involved in that situation or not, okay? 
This automatic brightness or dose control that we talked about, automatic exposure control, it uses sensors and sophisticated software to determine and adjust primarily the MA. Then if it can't get a decent enough quality image because the patient is so large, it'll start to bump up the KV. But remember, we don't want to do that because we want the certain contrast. Bumping the KV is going to reduce our contrast a bit, so it'll do that secondarily. It may change our filtration or do some other things. And the manner in which those are adjusted is, is a little bit complicated beyond the fact that MA is the first choice. What is this? This is our filtration. This is the filtration, the additional filtration that's put in front of the beam. Remember, that's going to increase the average X-ray beam energy. It's going to increase the quality of the beam. It's going to decrease the beam intensity. But with automatic brightness control or exposure control on, that's going to get compensated for with an increase in the MA or MAS. Okay? It doesn't change our spatial resolution. Here's our button for our grid. Okay? Here's the grid. So if you push this button on the Siemens, it will either put the grid in or take the grid out. Currently with it white, the grid is actually in place. So if we're doing a pediatric patient, right, we really want to make sure that we've taken that grid out there. It results in decreased scatter, so it improves our uh, contrast resolution in our image, it improves our image contrast, but unfortunately results in increased dose to the patient, so let's not use it in situations where there isn't much scatter in the first place. Okay? Um, it doesn't change our spatial resolution. This is our fluoro mode, whether we're doing continuous fluoro, pulse fluoro, cine fluoro, a DSA, that's the button right there that will control that. Make sure you've got it set the way you want, right? Going to pulse fluoro, the slower the pulse, the better the dose, the lower the dose to the patient. It actually gives you better spatial resolution. But sometimes that strobe effect is a little bit bothersome and irritating. And if things are happening rapidly, the, the pulse at the lower rate may be too slow to see the anatomy that you want to see on, let's say, a swallowing study or something like that. So, you know, you've got to make the setting what you need it to be to see the, the uh, pathology that you're looking for. It does result in a bit noisier imaging. I mentioned the strobe effect, right? We're going to use continuous fluoro, cine fluoro, and DSA only if needed. By the way, increasing levels of dose as we go up across those. This is the button that selects the type of contrast agent. And as you can imagine, when you hit that, it sets the KVP on the X-ray tube to match to that well, which is why we don't want to go adjusting the KVP on a contrast study unless we absolutely need to, right? We're going to bump our MA first to get our noise level about the area where we want. And then, so that's the contrast selection button. We, we, I just mentioned those two things. Of course, we can move this uh, flat panel detector up and down. We want to get it as close as possible to the patient. Remember the R squared effects. If we'll get it as close as possible to the patient, the spread of the radiation will have been less, and we can actually get by with a little bit less exposure. Not to mention the fact that getting it close to the patient means that more of the radiation is striking the II instead of potentially striking you as the operator. So it's better in ter terms of dose there as well. So get that as close as possible. Certainly you don't want to hit the patient with it, but uh, decreases um, dose, as I mentioned, decreases scatter primarily to you. I always like to lock it in place if I'm doing the type of study which allows for that to be done. Here's where we can move the patient left or right, up or down. Move the patient so that the region of interest is centered in the field of view. That allows you to collimate maximally or magnify if necessary. I'm going to talk about magnification in a second. And this minimizes any parallax that might occur. So, so really in terms of the best image quality, get the region of interest that you want to look at centered in the eye. Leave those lead curtains in place, if, if at all possible. It significantly decreases the radiation dose to you. Um, unfortunately, because of backscatter, it does minimally increase the dose to the patient. These are our collimators. Collimate as aggressively as possible. If you only need to see a particular area, remember, collimation is the one thing that we can do that improves image quality while reducing dose to both you and the patient. So collimate as aggressively as possible. <clears throat> 
Because of that decrease in scatter, it really improves the contrast or the contrast resolution in our image. And here are these magnification modes. And, and I tell you, really use them sparingly, especially on old II systems. Because on old II systems, if you magnify down to a smaller region, your minification gain is reduced, right? You now have a smaller area being projected onto the II. So there's not as much minification gain. And so therefore, the amount of NMA is boosted by the automatic exposure control to keep the brightness of the image about the same. That isn't quite as bad an effect in digital imaging systems where you can digitally boost the brightness of the image instead of having to, to do that. But you do pay the price of the image being a bit noisier there. So only magnification, I always say the resonance, right? Magnification is not the same as collimation. Right? If you can see the structure well without magnifying, collimate in on it aggressively, don't just magnify up on it, okay? And that'll help keep the dose as low as possible. I think I mentioned all these things. This is our button for fluoro spots. And back in the II days, you know, we, we had to use that because basically when you hit that button, you were taking a picture of the output on the image intensifier. But there's really, we have much less need to do that now where we've got a last image hold, where the image that was currently obtained while you were fluoroing on your pulse fluoro mode stays up on the monitor and you can just ask the tech to save that rather than taking an actual fluoro spot. That image was acquired with one-tenth the dose of if taking a fluoro spot. So certainly use the fluoro spots if you need a better quality image, right? You need an image with less noise to really show a structure very well that you're not seeing well at the lower uh, dose levels of fluoro. Um, but, uh, but do that very sparingly and use that last image hold feature whenever possible. <clears throat> I always say, right, fluoro is for looking, not cooking, right? If something's not changing, don't keep fluoroing, right? In today's systems where that last image hold stays up, if, some, if you're just not sure about something but you need to look at an image for a little while to see what's going on and it's not a dynamic thing, just get your foot off the pedal and look at that image and learn that. Getting your imaging time down will really be one of the best things that you can do in terms of keeping the dose as low as possible during fluoroscopy. And I think that's it. Thank you.